So let me say Christ is risen to you. Um, again, welcome everybody to this um, online event organized by IOCS um, entitled uh, Lockdown Conversations at IOCS. Um, this is a first event. It's a first for, for us all at the Institute. Um, so we hope that this will go <laughs> smoothly. Um, but um, um, I apologize in advance for any uh, mishap. Um, the event, as you probably uh, know from um, the information that was sent by email and published on the Institute's website, intends to be um, the first of a series dealing with the effects of this um, COVID-19 virus and of this epidemic and the lockdown that has been imposed in, um, in most parts of the world um, on, on countries and on faith communities. And what we're trying to do um, in this particular event, in this particular session, is to look at um, a limited number of issues, um, looking at um, issues of community life, parish life, liturgical practice, faith in the public and private space, ecumenical relations, um, um, environmental um, creation theology, um, because uh, these are some of the specialisms of our panel. And this brings me to our panel um, to today. Um, I'll start with Father Stephen Platt, whom um, you will probably see now here. I think he's um, larger than life even on the screen uh, uh, now. Um, not... Father Stephen um, is, um, is our chairman of the uh, board but um, he is also um, a, a parish priest in Oxford, um, parish priest in charge of the um, parish of St. Nicholas de Wonderwalker, um, Russian Orthodox um, um, Church in Oxford. He's also General Secretary of the Fellowship of St. Alban and St. Sergius, and a long-standing uh, friend and member of our Institute. Um, we also have um, on the panel uh, Father uh, Raphael Armer, who is um, a, or just a very dear friend to um, us all, but um, is also serving as a director of the Institute. He is based in Cambridge, um, where he serves, uh, has been serving for a long time in one of the most wonderful communities that I've come to know, even before I was a priest, um, the parish of St. Ephraim the, um, the Syrian, also um, Russian Orthodox um, parish. And Father uh, Raphael has been a long-standing, um, well, Associate Chaplain doesn't uh, quite do it justice. Um, Father Raphael has, has been a, a shoulder and a, a pastoral um, sort of um, soul for a lot of, of, of students of the Institute and, and members of the Institute uh, throughout the years. Um, we have as well, Dr. Elizabeth um, Theokritov, who, um, wonderful, um, wonderfully managed to join us. There was some, some trepidation uh, whether her connection will hold, but there she is now, um, Dr. Um, Theokritov or um, um, Elizabeth, as we tend to call her, um, is also um, a close friend of the Institute, um, a very close collaborator of the Institute. She is an associate lecturer for IOCS, um, also serving as one of our directors, and also based in Cambridge. And she um, is um, a specialist or has written extensively and we're fortunate to have her as someone who writes research um, and um, thinks profoundly about uh, theological ecology, um, justice, peace, the integrity of creation, um, things, pertaining to these type of um, issues, orthodoxy and ecology um, and um, so on. Um, another member of our panel is Dr. Christoph Schneider, who is our um, academic director. Uh, some of you are um, quite familiar with uh, Christoph um, if you're students of the Institute or have visited our website um, and know our courses. Um, Christoph uh, is a close colleague of mine. Um, um, and of Dr. Razvan Porum, whom I'm going to introduce um, um, last but no, uh, not least. And um, Dr. Schneider Christoph, his specialism is very much in um, 
Orthodox theology and continental philosophy, issues of faith and reason, metaphysics, uh, philosophy of language and se semiotics, um, the dialogue also to a degree, dialogue between um, science, um, philosophy, um, and politics. And um, Dr. Uh, Resvan Porum um, is um, sort of the last member of our panel that I'm introducing. He is the vice principal of the Institute, um, um, a lecturer here in Cambridge at the Institute. His specialism is um, ecumenism, um, ecumenical theology, um, elements of ecclesiology, um, and um, he's been doing wonderful research in this area. So I think we have a good spread among us um, as, as far as a panel for our first event goes. So having exhausted the introductions and I hope not your patience, <laughs> I will um, uh, proceed to um, um, ask a, a first question to open up the conversation. And as I was saying to my colleagues um, before we began, um, I'm not starting uh, with the clergy because of a clergy bias, um, being a clergy myself, but um, I want to ask um, Father Stephen and Father Raphael first um, this question, because I think um, the way that this pandemic has been um, affecting us all primarily, I think, is as members of faith communities, as members of parishes. Um, I personally feel that this is um, the first degree in which I am affected um, in terms of this pandemic, having been blessed uh, with, with staying healthy um, so, so far. So the first question to them is, how has this pandemic and the restrictions imposed in response have affected your particular community, your particular parish, um, and feel free to highlight positives and negatives of this. Um, who would like to, to go first? Father Stephen. Thank you, Father. Um, when we first began to understand the huge effect to which COVID-19 would be affecting us, both as individuals and as our church life, it was rather like watching um, a family come to terms with the fact that um, a bereavement was about to take place in many ways. Um, people struggled with the idea that something that they had been used to having without any questions asked would soon not be available. And remember in Britain when the um, uh, measures started to be taken, we were in the middle of Great Lent. The, uh, Sunday of the Cross was the last Sunday at which, although by that stage we'd already finished having services, uh, it was still possible for, come, for people to come to the church by themselves to pray. And then very shortly after that, there was a complete closure of churches as the lockdown became more uh, rigidly enforced. We in my parish uh, were fortunate in that for some months we had already been streaming audio of our services uh, online um, in order to help those who were housebound and unable to get to the liturgy. So there was something in place. But um, we were not prepared for the um, great sense of um, loss or bereavement, I would say, that people began to uh, show at not being able to come to church and not being able to receive the sacraments in particular, not being able to receive communion, bear in mind that this was in Lent when people are paying, one might expect, um, more attention to their spiritual life, to increase church attendance, to uh, greater effort with prayer and with fasting and with spiritual reading and works of mercy and so on. And here we are, all of a sudden, forced into a situation where we are in isolation. After a while, my uh, realisation was that for many people, um, uh, a new reality was, in fact, um, dawning, and that... Um, people would have to be 
um, adaptable, both as individuals and we as a church community, to the new situation. And we watched and we saw how very many different church communities began to um, uh, stream liturgical worship online or provide different areas of support for people uh, in terms of their um, life of prayer or offering um, uh, um, online discussion groups and um, talks and Bible studies and so on. But I think that perhaps for me, um, one of the most positive aspects that I have seen coming out of the um, different um, um, circumstances uh, relating to the pandemic has been the way in which the community has grown in strength in terms of its care for one another. The Apostle St. Paul tells us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And I have noticed how both in the, uh, within the church community, but also in the wider community at large, people have made a real effort to reach out to one another. And we've had to be very organized in the way that we've done this in terms of practical support, mutual burden bearing, keeping in touch with one another. And all of these seem to me to be an extension of our Eucharistic community. Um, it's been a big deal looking at the question as to uh, how the church can be the church without the Eucharist. Can the church be the church without the Eucharist? And I suppose we'll come on to ask some of those questions in the course of this discussion. But just to conclude, I would, uh, for, the, for the time being, I would say that I noticed within my own uh, parish, within my own church community, an extension of what it means to be a Eucharistic community, an extension of what it means to live the liturgy beyond the liturgy. Thank you very much, Father Stephen. Um, thank you. Father Raphael. Um, we're in a somewhat different situation from Father Stephen in as Oxford, the Oxford Parish has its own building. We, Lisa, have a, a um, an arrangement where we use the Church of St Clements in in Cambridge and that was rather interesting because the Church of England didn't seem to be able to make up its mind what it was going to do to begin with <clears throat> um, but within a by with by the Friday before the Sunday of the Cross we was clear, it was clear we could no longer use that building at all we'd gone from Having a, we had our last service was a pre-sanctified liturgy on the Wednesday. By Friday, it was completely closed. Um, and I talked with one or two people in the parish, and one of our young Romanians is quite a technological wizard, um, which I'm not, and he said. There's this, we tried, tried doing something together on Skype, first of all. So we did Skype for the first weekend. We had so many people that it was getting to the point where we could, we were in danger of having too many people to use Skype. So but, uh, he decided, Cosmin decided we should use Zoom. And what we did was on the Saturday, we did, I served, I served great Vespers in our sitting room here and on the Sunday morning, the liturgy. And um, I also said, I think that there's a need for us, for people to come together to pray. I could see people were getting, as I could have picked, what I was picking up was that people were very concerned and nervous about what was happening because of the virus. I said, we will have evening prayers every day at seven o'clock, Sunday to Friday. And it will last for 15 minutes, just simple things we know, Psalm, the, the gladsome light, um, the procumenon for the day, um, about say, a, a reading, about say for Lord, um, and a prayer against the coronavirus. Um, very simple. And it was amazingly well received. People did come every every day. They would be there um, 
joining in the prayers. And I thought that was very important to keep the people together, focused on something other than incessant news about the coronavirus. And our weekend worship, our, our sun, Saturday and Sunday uh, liturgical life has continued and feast days as well. We were able to have to maintain pretty much a full cycle during Holy Week. Well, bridegroom matins every evening, um, the 12 Gospels, much of it though now done by readers because the choir consisted of my wife and myself. Um, and I can tell you when you're trying to be the priest, half the choir and a server, it's really, <laughs> it's more than enough. Um, but I think people found that during Holy Week, it took on a, a different meaning, a different feel to it. It was very much deeper. You could sense that there was a, a, a depth. You were able to hear the words of, the, of all the, um, the antiphons, for instance, and as you perhaps couldn't have heard them before when they were sung, they were just read in most, in most of the time. And yes, I think people did feel that this was really something on which they could hang, hang themselves, as it were, to, to support themselves. And of course, uh, Pascha was different also. But similarly to what Father Stephen was saying, people are taking care of each other in the parish. And we've got people who are in, in working in the health service. And just in the last couple of days, one of our ladies has been diagnosed with the coronavirus. Um, works at Addenbrooke's Hospital. Um, so there is a cost to serving. Um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Raphael. Um, well, we already have, um, I, I have at least a few questions to follow up, but I won't exhaust them now. Um, I'm sure um, everyone joining has um, their own questions or things that um, we'll have a chance to, uh, to discuss um, um, later on. Um, I want to turn now a little bit um, um, to, um, and ask um, Elizabeth and Dr. Uh, Theokritov, um, um, a question, um, because at least in the public um, awareness, or it has been certainly in the news, one of the positives, if we can put it this way, of this pandemic um, has been, and still is, I suppose, that pollution levels have dropped um, around the world, that nature seems to have um, received some time to heal, um, and possibly that we are starting to see nature in a new light, um, we're, we're rediscovering uh, things that we were resisting to before in terms of our responsibility and relationship with nature. Um, at the same time, this pandemic uh, has appeared or by all accounts seems to have um, generated because of the misuse of or the, the abuse of nature, of, of the natural world by people. So. I suppose my question, um, Elizabeth, would be what implications or, or what insights can we draw um, from um, a theology of creation with an autodox perspective in relation to this, this pandemic, to the relationship with, with nature, with God's creation? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, yes, and uh, as, you, as you point out, there are various points that many commentators have made that you know suddenly the lockdown has dramatically lessened our demands on the earth and the supposedly impossible changes to consumer culture have happened overnight and of course these are temporary measures uh, what sort of changes people are willing to make permanently is quite a different matter going more deeply into the spiritual lessons uh, it's certainly true that many people are discovering unexpected riches in this new normal. They can actually hear the birds for a start. They have time to explore their locality, uh, to look at the plants and try and grow them. 
And also something that I think is very interesting is what one can call an asceticism of obedience, the, the limiting of one's own desires, whims, for the sake of the needs of others. And that's something that many people embrace. It's also the sort of thing that environmentalists have been talking about for years. But now people suddenly feel that they're part of a greater whole and this gives value and dignity to our most insignificant actions or indeed inactions. You know, not going out is suddenly a heroic contribution to a, a greater cause. And this is also a profoundly ecclesial approach, this awareness that we are all part of a body, we all play our part in something much larger than ourselves. And many people certainly would want to incorporate some of this simpler life into a new normality, but then there are the countervailing pressures. Uh, you know, we've just been told that public transport could be dangerous, so prefer private cars. One of the striking things about this crisis is that, in contrast to Second World War, with which people keep comparing it, this really feels like a, a crisis for a post-Christian age. It's, you know, in many ways a crisis without reference to God, to quite a, a chilling degree. But it's instructive, of course, to see the ways in which Christ finds his way back in, very obviously in love for neighbor. You know, there are going to be a whole lot of other people who are surprised at the last day that they've been ministering to Christ. But also through the natural world, which always points back to its nature, however much people may try to focus on it for its own sake. And there's a wonderful passage in one of Olivier, Olivier Clément's books where he quotes the saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then he goes on to say, but the world too is a word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And in a way uh, for, for lay people, and certainly my own experience, the, the closure of church buildings has removed that temptation to try and pin down the, the sacred and the sacramental elsewhere to the church where we go to for high days and holidays. And our experience has become much more like monastic experience where everything we touch refers us to God. One of the much less welcome effects is that the virus brings us face to face with creaturely fragility. I'm, I mean less welcome for society generally. I mean, one might hope that for Christians this is uh, not so unwelcome. But we are being firmly and forcefully reminded that life and death is in the hands of God. We are not in control. The irony, of course, is that this whole raft of draconian measures is precisely predicated on the assumption that control should be the norm we're trying to control our way out of the crisis. We're going to manage things until we can produce a vaccine. And of course, you know, we, we all uh, regard that as a welcome prospect because it's a visceral human fear, sudden death. It's something that we pray for protection from. And a sudden and unexpected death greatly exacerbates the, the pain of losing someone we love. But it seems that in the public, general public reaction, there's also another element, a sense that unpredictable, deadly disease is seen as a sort of insult to this whole edifice of technological civilization. You know, this is something that we shouldn't have to contend with in the 21st century. It, it goes against, in fact, that culture of control, which arguably lies at the root of all our environmental problems, because basically we've been demanding of the earth more than it can give. And I think the response from the Christian tradition 
has to be welcome back to the real world. That's why we talk about the world of the fall. Imperfection, mortality, these things are built in. You know, we can juggle things a bit, we can pull here and push there, but basically we, we can't eliminate that characteristic of the world. So death is something that we use, we remember it, so as to make best use of our life. It's not something we can just brush under the carpet. And it does seem now we're actually seeing the beginning of a discussion of the unmentionable, of death and of how we value life. And this I think is likely to continue and it'll be very interesting to see where it goes. And extremely important for the Christian voice to be heard. Uh, I'm not talking so much about ethical questions, you know, how do we value life? How do we compare value of different people's lives? We actually need to challenge the very idea that physical survival is the paramount value. And effectively that means rediscovering the soul, by which I don't mean a sort of immaterial thing that takes up residence in the body at a certain point and eventually leaves, but the soul as the fullness of the person's life, which is manifested of course in physical life on earth, but isn't bounded by it. And this perspective affects every aspect of life on earth. And it's something where there really is a big difference between the Christian and the secular understanding and something I think we have to bear witness to. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was um, incredibly rich. Um, I've made notes myself and um, I think this insight, um, particularly the insight of, of um, the rediscovering life um, or interaction with the environment and with uh, society, with, with our world, also as a monastic vocation, as a monastic practice in a way in, relationship, in relation to the sacred, this is, is um, and something that we should keep in mind, I suppose. It also reminded me what you said of, of the uh, sort of um, vener venerable desert um, saying, uh, sit in your cell and it will teach you everything. Mm. Uh, I think we've, we're, we're struggling to live up to that um, well, invitation in a way. Um, so thank you very much. Um, what you've said, I think naturally leads me to um, direct my next question to Dr. Christoph Schneider, to Christoph, because uh, you've talked about, Elizabeth, about how this is an insult, as it feels like an insult to our civilization, to our well um, um, sort of buttoned um, controlling um, system, particularly in the West, um, it's all efficient and directed and guided by science. And um, well, I suppose, a lot of the responses that we've heard, um, particularly from authorities, from, from politicians, uh, is that these responses are based on science, are based on the science of things, based on scientific data and insight. Uh, but this has also created a lot of debate, um, has led up to a lot of conspiracy theories and sometimes to a breakdown of trust um, between politicians and people, between um, politicians and scientists, between scientists themselves <laughs> and so on. And somewhere in the midst of all this, the church seems to be caught in a loop, uh, particularly the Orthodox Church, um, as, uh, and particularly in the West, um, but also in countries like Romania, Russia, and so on, where church-state relations are so um, tight, or traditionally have been very close. Um, but the church is caught in between, uh, almost like an, on an, an impossible staircase um, between uh, the state on the one hand, the science on the other, and we just have to wait and take our cues from, from these um, sides, um, as it were, or just bear with um, the decisions. So Christoph, I, my question to you is really um, along these lines. Um, how do you see that um, the church can come out? I mean, is there any other response that the church could have in relation to um, this dialogue between scientists and politicians to which the church seems to be a spectator at the moment or any input that the church brings seems to be um, sort of um, left um, um, 
uh, in the background. Thank you for the yes. Uh, I think the, the most important point is that um, we should listen to both of them, to both camps, so to say, to the, to the politicians and, and to the scientists. Um, but we should also be uh, critical listeners, of course, because in, in this situation we are in now, the dialogue between science and politics is, of course, of utmost importance for obvious reasons, yeah? Yes. Um, there is this question, what measures must be taken to protect the population and how long and so on. And I think we've, we've seen this in the last week. So one of the main problems is that politicians are not scientists and scientists are not politicians. So first, politicians don't understand much about epidemiology, or respiratory disease. Uh, neither Matt Hancock nor Boris Johnson have undergone medical training, and I think it shows. On the other hand, uh, scientists are not politicians. Right? And very often, they are not willing to, to make uh, polit political decisions, uh, understandably, and they don't want to be held responsible for the uh, political ambitions of their scientific uh, findings or hypothesis. Again, this is uh, very understandable. And that means that in the end, the scientists and uh, the politicians you know, have to make the decisions. And that's also correct because they represent the, uh, the, the population. But how can politicians you know, decide true and reliable? And that, that's a very difficult task. And so if something goes wrong, you know, this, this dilemma you know, comes to the surface, uh, very much so. So sometimes the politicians blame the scientists and in other situations, the scientists uh, blame the politicians. To give a very uh, recent example um, that was um, published in the mainstream media in The Guardian, there was a professor, I don't know how to pronounce his name, uh, Professor David Strita. He uh, complained and wrote, as scientists, I hope I never again hear the phrase based on, based on the best science and evidence. This phrase has become basically meaningless and used to explain everything and anything. So you can see that this tension that can uh, emerge you know, in this dialogue between science and politics. And I think you know, the, the theological solution to this is a kind of union between science and politics without confusion. You know, that's the Byzantine <laughs> approach. <laughs> so union in the sense that political decisions in this time of crisis should be based on science. That's entirely clear. But there shouldn't be confusion. And so what does it mean? When, when do we have confusion? If, for instance, political considerations influence or even overrule scientific insights or uh, advice. And not too long ago, we had a kind of minor scandal in this respect that, that showed that things can go wrong. There was the former chief scientific advisor, his name is Sir David King, and he said he was shocked to discover there were political advisors on the uh, SAGE, you know, you know this the scientific advisory group for emergencies. And he emphasized that if you're giving science advice, your advice should be free of any political bias. So yeah, this shows this tension that, that can emerge between uh, scientists and, and politicians. And to me, you know, what is, what I see as, as problematic is that the government in, in this country, as well as in other countries, it's a similar situation, they often claim that there is a unanimous scientific consensus about the necessity of this nationwide lockdown. And in fact, um, it's not that simple. There are many uh, internationally around scholars, you know, epidemiologists, virologists, who have a completely different view now, for us lay people, it's not possible to decide who is right and who is wrong. That would be kind of, uh, you know, 
kind of un unwise if you could just enter this debate. But the uh, government should be honest enough to, to acknowledge that you know it, it's not it's not simple. It's it's a very complicated question, and uh, alternative views um, actually already exist. You know, um, so this this is very important. So if they want to gain the trust of the population, then they should, they should acknowledge it and and include these these alternative voices in the process of decision making. I think that that's very important. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, again, um, we might need a follow-up event after all the all of the contributions um, so far. Certainly, um, we will have another one. Um, but um, what you um, were saying, um, again, helpfully, I suppose, leads me to the next question I want to ask um, Dr. Rezvan Porumb. Um, Rizvan, because um, you were mentioning um, this this um, sort of dialogue of, of um, and the, the problem of consensus and the problem of uh, finding a middle ground and reaching, as it were, across the um, the aisle. Um, well, this crisis um, has affected also, I think. Um, I think it has an impact on the life of the church, not just of the Orthodox Church, but on the life of the church as a whole. Um, and a lot of us, as Father Raphael was mentioning, um, as Orthodox communities, particularly in the West, um, rely on um, other Christians <laughs> to provide in normal times as were a place of worship. Uh, we share churches with a lot of uh, Christians in, in a lot of um, places. So there is an ecumenical dimension to our um, life and I suppose an ecumenical uh, dimension to the way that uh, this crisis affects us all. Um, so I wanted to ask um, you, Rezvan, um, what do you see as the effect of this pandemic on um, ecumenical relations, but with a particular emphasis on um, this idea about identity, um, the implications on ecclesial identity, on communion, on fellowship, um, because um, I think these are, are things that um, affect both a conversation within the Orthodox Church, but uh, we should be aware of this conversation also in an ecumenical sense. Um, we live um, very close to, to many um, sort of non-Orthodox certain um, fellow Christians, um, and we're now all affected by this. Yes, uh, thank you, Father Um It is not... Uh readily obvious um, how the current uh, pandemic is connected to ecumenism, perhaps. Um, but I've scribbled down some thoughts, and I hope they'll come across as uh, something coherent. Um, now, it seems to me that the current pandemic crisis is pushing us to reflect on ecumenism beyond its traditional understanding as a global dialogue and reconciliation between the main Christian traditions. It forces us as Orthodox to reflect on our attitude towards ecumenism, on how we perceive ourselves in ecumenical contexts. And it forces us to start our ecumenical reflection at the level of our local context and to see ecumenism as a fundamental component of our faith. Um, indeed, if uh, we view ecumenism uh, as that vector which continuously spurs us on towards an ever greater Catholicity of the church um, as a central principle of our theology, uh, a vector which always strives to maintain the unity of the church at the same time, then the concept of ecumenism becomes relevant in a different light. And even, even in this current uh, very peculiar context, um, the Orthodox world was already in a state of uh, relative fragmentation um, after the debacle of Crete um, and the Ukrainian schism. Um, the current pandemic and all adjacent debate has brought further tensions, I feel, to the table. Um, now we're talking about contemporary versus traditional, scientific versus sacramental, societal rejection versus societal engagement. 
um, the fact that the Eucharist has no longer been available to the faithful, although this is a temporary measure uh, and has, and it, this has already been um, emphasized by um, some of the speakers before, um, this has triggered an intense emotional confusion at the level of local communities. Um, the Eucharist is the ultimate reality of communion, uh, of church unity. Um, indeed, it is for the Orthodox the definitive proclaimed goal of global ecumenism, of church unity, um, while at the same time remaining the sharpest reminder of division. Um, as we know, the Orthodox do not accept intercommunion with, uh, with other Christian traditions. Um, so the Orthodox perspective with regard to ecumenism uh, is this. We are Orthodox and in communion because we share the same Eucharist grounded on unified doctrine. Um, others are not Orthodox and outside the church unity as they are being barred from the Eucharist at least until such times when we are all able to share the same communion in a context of full doctrinal <coughs> agreement. At least that's roughly the idea of most Orthodox participating in these ecumenical um, conversations. But now the unthinkable has happened when, due to the specific context of this contagious disease, um, the mass of the Orthodox faithful have themselves been deprived of the Eucharist. This was perceived by some uh, of the Orthodox faithful as punishment from God. Uh, for many more still, this represented an attack against the church, with people often rejecting it as a reflex, uh, despite the very real and specific context of the pandemic and of the fact that such measures have been imposed to protect the public, uh, to protect the others. So um, as uh, uh, Father Stephen has uh, asked earlier, um, can the church still exist? Uh, can there still be unity? Can we still have Christ in our lives without the possibility to partake of his holy body? This is uh, the kind of profound ecclesiological reflections with which the faithful are now grappling on a, on a daily basis. Um, now in a, in a very interesting sermon that was uh, publicized uh, circulated in the Romanian context, um, uh, a sermon uh, on the Great and Holy Thursday from Patriarch Daniel of Romania. Uh, in this sermon, he invited the faithful to uh, consider uh, communing with Christ in other ways, now that, of course, uh, the Eucharist was no longer available. Um, the Patriarch spoke about the Fathers of the Desert, who received communion very rarely, but they received communion through prayer, through spiritual toil, and through much love towards God and towards their fellow humans. And I've quoted now from Patriarch Daniel. Of course, um, the Patriarch emphasizes that the Eucharist remains the highest form of communion with God. But even so, this is, I think, a theological direction few could have foreseen outside the context of the pandemic. Also, I feel that this context has brought a special kind of test, in some ways a valuable test um, for all Christians. While we are all used to take responsibility for ourselves and our close family, um, now our actions may affect other people, people who are strangers to us, but whom we are now called to protect. Uh, and we are not only called to protect uh, the others within the church community, we are challenged to protect the others within the wider society, those of no faith uh, or even of a different faith. Um, this is where I think our experience of faith during the lockdown acquires an ecumenical dimension. As after forcing us to look inwards, the pandemic urges us to look outwards, in a sense, towards the others. And taking these things into consideration, I think the, this period of quarantine can help us become more ecumenically minded and more pastorally minded, um, since ecumenism 
perhaps can be seen as a form of expanded pastoral practice, uh, pastoral life. It reminds us, this pandemic, that uh, we as Orthodox are not disconnected or detached from the secular society, but are inextricably, inextricably connected to it. And we are indeed expected to interact with it as an extension of our church family. And it urges us to repent, perhaps for our existing lack of love and for our own fragmentation. Um, in effect, orthodoxy is not merely something that the other Christians are meant to discover, but something that needs to be rediscovered and attained by the Orthodox themselves on a daily basis. Um, this period then helps us reconsider the importance of, of praying together, of reading the scripture, of working together to help those who are struggling um, as first stages of communion. Um, and it helps us to look outwards toward the other, our neighbor whom we have never met, uh, whose name we don't know, but whom we cannot exclude from our lives. And this is the beginning of ecumenism, I see, as a component of our lives. And I believe that um, we can come out of this troubled period uh, wiser and filled with more love than before, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Rezvan. Uh, that was very, uh, very rich as well. Um, I think this um, realization of, of our responsibility to one another and of rediscovering the neighbor um, really is the bridge between uh, both Orthodox um, within the Orthodox Commonwealth and um, so basically between neighboring parishes, but also between us as ecclesial bodies uh, in relation to other, other Christians. Um, that has been very um, helpful, at least to me. Um, I am mindful of, of the time. Um, um, we did say that we're going to run this for about an hour, but I, I think we have some room to extend um, the conversation by 10, 15 minutes, um, also to um, allow some space for questions um, and a conversation. Uh, I'm sure people have, have questions. We'll, we'll try and be as... Um, uh, efficient with that stage as we can be. Um, but uh, I want to ask now uh, something that really comes out of what has been said already and something that Rizvan has sort of touched um, uh, and now. And um, it has to do with this um, access to the sacraments, to the Eucharist, to um, how we understand each other as, as um, uh, as orthodox, uh, really, um, and um, I'm asking this to the panel, so feel free to answer um, 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 anybody on the panel, but do you think that this pandemic has exposed, and I'm not apologizing if, if this is a bit more of a um, provocative question, but has this pandemic exposed a rift between sort of traditionalists and, well, it's a bad word, modernists, but people who are trying to um, ask different questions, let's put it this way, and find different ways of dealing with, with the things that we are going through. Um, so a rift between these two camps in the Orthodox Church, has it made it more visible, do you think? Has it, or is it wrong to think in this way? Um, is this um, just another way of, of, of creating uh, an antagonistic, dualistic um, perspective? So that's my question to you. Uh, and I think it's based on a lot of what we see out there. We just um, on social media, on, on different blogs, on different um, outlets, um, and often in our parishes. Um, so um, if anybody wants to um, step forward for this question, you're very welcome. There is clearly a spectrum of approaches which um, has found its focus, I think, largely in the debate over access to communion. And also, if we're speaking frankly, about uh, whether it is possible for any physical harm to come to people attending the Divine Liturgy. What I have found interesting is that um, 
especially in the context of the uh, tensions and um, um, difficulties that exist between different parts of the Orthodox world at the moment, uh, this spectrum of um, approach transcends all of these. So we find the same spectrum in the Greek, Slav, Romanian, and to a lesser extent, Arab Orthodox worlds. I feel that what we are also looking at here is a kind of um, um, polarization between uh, spiritual individualism and the sense of belonging to the church as the body of Christ. It strikes me that those who were most um, upset about not being able to receive communion were perhaps those whose approach to communion was in many ways more individualistic, more on the vertical line the relationship between me and uh, Christ. But um, there is another aspect to communion, which is the horizontal. In the anaphora of the liturgy of St. Basil the Great, after the consecration of the holy gifts, the priest prays to God to unite us all together who partake of the one bread and the one cup. So communion is not simply about a vertical, my access to divine grace through partaking of the holy mysteries, but it's also about my access to uh, the other person, to being bound together in the uh, unity that exists in the sacrament. Uh, Father John Bear once pointed out very interesting in, interestingly in a talk that I heard him give, about the appearance of the risen Christ to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, that, that he became known to them in the breaking of the bread, having explained to them the scriptures, but they didn't recognize him as he explained the scriptures, only when he broke the bread. And at the moment that they, he broke the bread and they partake, he vanishes. And Father John Bear said, could this be because at that moment they have be received him, that they become the body of Christ at this point. And I think this is very important and perhaps something which is overlooked in the context of the, should we say, more individualistic and perhaps, uh, I hesitate to use the word, but pietistic approach. I notice that many of those who have been deprived of sacramental communion, certainly in my experience, have rediscovered what it is to find Christ in the written word, the scriptures, to encounter Christ in the Gospels. And I've also noticed, which I find encouraging, that um, in spite of our divisions as Orthodox, there has been perhaps more unity, uh, having all been deprived of sacramental communion, um, through working together to study, to learn, to pray together, as we've heard earlier, to read the scriptures together. And this I found extremely encouraging. So I hope this is something that we will uh, carry with us through the period of the pandemic um, to when um, things return to a greater normality. Let us hope that we as Orthodox learn uh, from our deprivation of communion. Could it be that this is in fact a blessing to us to have been uh, placed into a position where we must look deeply. Have we become used to receiving communion to the point that it's simply a given, an automatic, uh, something that we take for granted, or something that we use to beat each other with by depriving one another of it and breaking communion with one another? These are some of the questions that I have been asking myself over the last few weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Father Stephen. I wanted to ask a, a follow-up question. D do you think that, uh, um, what would be a way forward to, to, to heal some of these divisions and, and or some of these um, um, sort of um, personal crises that some people have in relation to, do you think uh, education is a, is a way forward? Do you think we need to rethink our catechesis? Do you think we need to, to, to refocus on, on um, 
uh, on some some issues uh, in relation to the, the Eucharist ecclesiology as as we go back eventually to to our communities and and we can have not just meetings by Zoom. Um, <laughs> so is, is there, question? the question is, is, is do you? I'm sorry. Is that a question addressed to me? For... Well, uh, as a follow-up question to what you said, um, a question to you and to to any other of the panelists. Do you think we need to rethink uh, the way we do catechesis? That we need to focus on on uh, on Christian education in our parishes uh, in a different way uh, than we than we've been doing it before. Because to have this response is already a, a sign, I would think, of of something that was lacking there. I've been thinking a lot over the past few weeks since we read the life of Mary of Egypt in the middle of Lent on the example of St. Mary of Egypt, who in her life receives communion twice, according yeah. to <coughs> the account of St. Sophronius of Jerusalem. There is a first moment of communion, which is a reconciliation with God, having realized her need for repentance. But it's not until the end of her life that she um, uh, is able to receive communion again, having worked a whole lot of things through. And that period of her life in the desert can be seen not only as a repentance, but a kind of ongoing education, in a sense. Mm. And it's interesting that in the life of Mary of Egypt, she quotes the scriptures, and yet she's never had, she's never, she confesses that she's never read any of the holy books. She has become, as it were, uh, infused in what it is to be part of the body of Christ, the, the sacramental body of the Christ, and the body of Christ as defined through the scriptures. And not through any exposure to these things, but through an ongoing purification. And um, I think that it's not simply a question of religious education of individuals within our community, but a need for uh, a purification of ourselves, mm. a cleansing, um, a, a washing. This is what we're celebrating through the whole of the Pentecostalian period, which is a baptismal period. I think perhaps we've forgotten what it means to have been um, justified, illumined, sanctified, washed, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Perhaps this is where we need to be. Thank you, Father. It, it, it seems to me that this invites us to a broader understanding of communion uh, rather than depriving us of something. Uh, Schmemann, in, in his book on the Eucharist, uh, criticizing the, the rupture between Eucharist as sacrifice and partaking of communion. Uh, and he's arguing for receiving communion as being a self-evident part of attending the Eucharist. But as uh, you know, many people would recognize, in a way, you know, that, that itself has been taken to an extreme. And uh, by, by the same logic, I think one can argue that holding together the offering in our, the communion of the entire community and receiving communion helps us to see how we're not excluded from Eucharistic communion when we're physically unable to receive. And this, this ties in with the question that was sent to us in advance about mm. uh, the, the physicality of the sacraments and the problem when we're not able literally to receive the sacraments. It seems to me that that isn't meant to be, we, we don't believe in an exclusive focus on the physical we believe that God comes to us through all aspects of our life, which includes the physical. This is not in any way a limitation on God's grace. And if we're, if our understanding of God's presence in the physical world is expanded by this, that I think is a gain. Yes. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. <clears throat> I think um, it's important to reaffirm the fact that the Eucharist exists in a context and we can often um, get some sort of tunnel vision in, in relation to receiving the Eucharist and, and kind of 
reducing everything to that. Um, I've seen people who, uh, um, you know, take you, you, I mean, receiving Eucharist has not made them change their life at all. And as Father Stephen um, pointed out, um, I think if we remove the, the Eucharistic communion from that context um, of, of co continuous metanoia, of continuous um, schesis in, in all the ways that Elizabeth has mentioned and all of us have, have, have indicated in one way or another in, in the responses here, uh, then we're literally treating Eucharist as like going into a pharmacy and always going for a particular um, a pill um, when we are chronically ill of other things and just changing our diet, changing our way of life would, would help that medicine work better. Uh, it's not to say that the medicine doesn't work. Um, excellent. Well, Elizabeth, you have uh, sort of tackled what I wanted to, um, to uh, bring forward now. The question that we received um, uh, by email, I'll just read it out um, to do it justice. The question that we um, were asked, the panel was asked was, uh, given that physicality is of paramount importance in the Orthodox tradition, especially in terms of the sacraments, how easily can the church adapt to a situation where physical access to the sacraments is limited or even perhaps non-existent in some circumstances? So I think Elizabeth has, uh, has provided um, an answer to that. Um, I, I don't want to um, provide necessarily an answer as a, as a member of the panel as such, but I will say that I think one way um, that the, the church is mediating this or has mediated this is by encouraging people to rediscover their home church. Mm. Uh, and take that space seriously. Um, and uh, here I resonate very much with what Father Raphael was saying at the beginning, um, rediscovering my own living room as, as a, um, an altar, as a place where you can serve, and, and my family as, as my church, um, um, and, and my friends whom I remember. Um, I was having a conversation with um, someone um, by text, a member of my parish, and I, I told her that uh, she kept asking me, Father, should we send you prayer lists every Sunday uh, or every week uh, for the Sunday or if it's enough if we send it last week? And I said, look, send it every Sunday if you can, because it makes me feel less alone mm. <laughs> to receive an email, to receive a text with those prayer lists and to think, to know that somebody is actively thinking of me as someone who can pray with them or for them. Well, that, that is an immense comfort. Um, and it reinforces kind of, it, it, it's, a, it's almost a, a physical thing. You feel it physically that someone has, you don't send a letter, you don't put pen to paper, but you write it on a keyboard or you send it um, from your phone. So I think we are rediscovering ways of mediating that, that physicality um, and, and um, possibly understanding all of this or are unraveling layers of mystical reality around us uh, or of our relationship in ways that uh, as Elizabeth was saying if you're just going to church on high days and holidays then you might not um, be aware of we just take those things for granted okay um, I'm giving the panel an opportunity to say anything that um, they wanted to say um, in relation to some of the things that we've discussed and then I'll open the conversation to questions um, there was um, a, someone sent a, a message saying that they want to um, ask a question, um, but um, the panel has one, is it a one last chance to um, um, give a final word or a final reflection or anything that was on their mind. I just wanted to ask, if, is there a way of making available to participants uh, references to articles on the web because there are two that's highly relevant one by uh Yerondisa Thekla uh one of uh, Elder Ephraim's monasteries in Quebec uh talking about the experience of not being a regular priest not having communion uh, the other is an article in Greek by uh Evi Vulgaraki who was hoping to join us but not able to uh on the meaning of communion. Is there some way we can put links to those that people can? I could um, I could add the links, Elizabeth, to the uh, post online where we have advertised for the for, for this for this uh, 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 encounter. 
I'll send them to you. Thank you. Yes, uh, and we can always add the uh, the links um, to the YouTube video, um, as, as it were, uh, when it's posted mm -hmm. online as as um, additional information, uh, and send it to people by email. Um, wonderful. So, um, okay, um, I know that. Um, well, there have been a few messages in the chat sent to us sort of privately before I open the um, um, conversation to questions. Um, I think, to be fair, well, I am aiming for five questions. Um, so um, use your, your ammunition uh, properly. <laughs> there is some um, um, uh, leeway there. But um, some of the messages here, um, just to say, because they're useful, um, I'll say that. Um, Apparently, the um, um, Father Chris Abkis, uh, I'm not sure exactly where, um, in Halki, I suppose, uh, there's a course, uh, whether that's online or not, I don't know, about Creation Care, Christian Responsibility course for parishes and youth groups. Um, and um, so that's a wonderful initiative, and hopefully it will be publicized um, more widely on the Orthodox channels for more people to hear about it. Um, uh, another um, comment here was that apparently um, there's um, a priest in the roll call uh, with the blessing of Bishop Irene uh, driving uh, um, to faith to, to their communities, um, to members of the community's uh, homes to uh, give uh, the holy mysteries. Um, and um, that's one way to mediate this. Um, I think as long as people take excellent uh, care and, and respect all the health um, measures that are recommended, that's a very commendable um, activity. Uh, and may God bless them all. Um, but as long as people don't put themselves to risk, uh, at risk and, other, and, and people that they encounter, um, so that's fine. Um, so the first one that I think needs an opportunity to say something from the participants is Father Paolo Perletti. And uh, Father Paolo, I will unmute you. So I'm not sure whether you have a question or um, a comment, but um, hopefully um, it will be uh, um, something that we can pick up. Um, just a second. I'm trying to unmute you. Just a second, Father. Father Paolo, um, uh, we cannot hear you. Just a second. Whether your microphone is off. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Many greetings to all, Christos Anesti. I introduce me myself quickly. I'm a priest in the Ecumenical Patriarchate and I am also a professor of medicine. And uh, I just wanted to share you a couple of very quick considerations. Uh, in this period, I've been uh, literally horrified by all those who propose to apply the concept of herd immunity to entire populations and countries. Because herd immunity means that the weak shall die and the fit shall survive. So on one side, lockdown protects the weak. Herd immunity is life-threatening for the weak. It is the most unchristian thing I heard during this period. It reminds me a little bit of the time before World War II. And uh, a second very short consideration to share with sisters and brothers and with my brother priests is this. Uh, there is a big deal of discussion and sometimes of fight concerning the way of distributing the Eucharist, something that I nicknamed the spoon theology. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and actually, personally, pastorally, I have been confronted with the pastoral difficulty of explaining to people that receiving the Eucharist from an infected spoon or an infected chalice may at the same time kill you and at the same time see a drop of immortality in your soul. So the problem is that many people confuse the physical uh, and the metaphysical, uh, the contingent and the eternal, the priest and the wizard, the magic and the spiritual. Uh, so I think this is, 
particular uh, uh, issue that I felt quite uh, uh, stringent in, in, in my pastoral practice. I don't want to take any, uh, any, any, longer, any longer time. Uh, greetings Thank to you. everyone. Thank you very much, Father, Father Paolo. That was very insightful. It's, it's good to have your perspective um, as well, both as a priest and as, as someone with, with medical um, expertise. That is great. Um, uh, Christoph? Uh, oh, thank you. For yes, I find it's a, a very interesting Eucharistic theology, and I think it's, it's, it's basically correct. But um, just a few remarks about your first uh, statement. I, I don't entirely agree with you because some people, some scholars who said herd immunity uh, is the right way to go also suggested that the vulnerable and elderly people should be protected much more um, consistently than now because they didn't say we, should, should, we shouldn't do anything at all because at the moment 50 to 70% of the people who die, die in care homes, despite the lockdown. And I've never heard anything who said, we should not protect the vulnerable or elderly people or people with um, preconditions. Okay. Um, thank you for that response, Christoph. I mean, it's, it's uh, it's always good to um, to have um, sort of um, this this perspective of um, sort of keep, keeping in mind that it's all in the nuance, uh, it's all in the details, uh, and uh, it just goes to show how much of a complicated issue this is, <laughs> that there's no clear answer, that there's no safe option to take, and the best that we can do is to um, is to uh, um, keep um, those who are at risk of being most affected in mind and as it were we're only as strong as our weakest link i think that is sort of the lesson of this um, situation that we're in um, that's wonderful um, there was a question somebody wanted to ask a question um, regarding um, communion antonis antonis uh, wants to ask a question, Antonis. Okay, great. I'll unmute you. Uh, you have the, the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, my participation, I'm actually this kind of question observation. Uh, it's uh, pretty much on the same lines as uh, Father Paulus. Uh, I'm, uh, my background is uh, I'm working at the University of Exeter in uh, philosophy and politics. Uh, I don't have too much background in theology, but I'm working on it. Uh, I would like to... Uh, uh, ask you because all the situation in the public uh, socio-political situation which also involved in Greece with some um, traditionalists uh, which um, might think indeed that uh, it might be uh, entirely uh, safe due to the change metaboli uh, uh, happening uh, due the, uh, the, during the Eucharist as um, uh, Saint John of Damascus describes uh, uh, the, the mystery uh, uh, they think they are particular. Uh, they I think they are safe, uh, but of course, then what happens with the spoon? And but, but uh, uh, generally, uh, many people have an intellectualist. Uh, they would need some sort of intellectualist, and probably, as uh, Father Stephen Platt said, uh, individualist uh, approach to that phenomenon. How does one approach someone who needs a little bit about the metaphysics in a sort of mechanism about what happens in, uh, in communion? because they might not be persuaded by the, uh, the communion. I personally, personally am by the theology of the communion as participation and as the pandemic as an opportunity to uh, reflect widely about what the physical and nature is and to consider the absence of uh, communion uh, right now uh, as an uh, opportunity uh, to uh, uh, follow a more monastic uh, path. How does one uh, uh, address to these people who want this intellectualist direction, a little bit of the mechanics, which of course it's not approached theologically as far as I know, uh, but uh, how, how da, does one deal with that? Okay, thank you so uh, much, uh, Antonis. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure um, who from the panel wants to take up the question uh, or whether 
um, um, you think that we've addressed this uh, before. I would like to say something, uh, uh, not to uh, provide a, a full answer, but um, I think <laughs> the issue on the one hand is that a lot of this conversation about, as you were mentioning, Antonio, Antonis, about the metaphysical reality, all of these high theological issues uh, are often taking place in a bubble, in the bubble of theologians, uh, clergy, uh, philosophers of religion uh, and so on. Uh, whereas um, people in the church um, are, are on the one hand not part um, of those conversations. Often if they're part, th this conversation will um, um, lead to more confusion than clarity uh, for people. So I think what they're looking for is for clear practical answers um, to a very deep instinct and desire that they have and we all have in relation to communion and to receiving the Eucharist. Uh, now, incidentally, um, I read the guidance that um, the Romanian um, uh, metropolitan aid in, in, in Germany, Switzerland, and um, that part of Europe has, has issued to um, the churches, to the priests in relation to communion, because now they're starting to opening up a little bit churches uh, there. Um, with limited number of people and social distancing in the church, and um, that might be a good case to um, to study um, now for for all of us who are not in that situation. But they've given um, instructions about using um, um, different spoons for people to receive communion. That if there's a priest and uh, a deacon serving, they will only they will not both partake of the chalice. The, they will use a different spoon each, and so on. So the priest. So. Um, just an example. So um, I think there are ways in which we can mediate this uh, on a very practical level without affecting the essence of the theology of the Eucharist. Uh, and to end um, my, my uh, two pence of a comment is that we need, we need to forget that the practice of receiving communion with a spoon has been introduced somewhere in the 12th century in the church as a response to already some uh, exaggerations and some some very um, sort of pietistic approaches that people had in terms of how they were receiving communion, taking communion home, uh, bringing special uh, vessels in which they they would uh, receive communion and take it home. And so uh, that was a way to mediate uh, another situation. Uh, it has not affected the theology of the chalice, but it has affected the way that we distribute um, uh, communion and how we partake of it. Um, so I think this is a, 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 an open issue. I think um, this will lead um, many theologians and, and, and I think the church to possibly reconsider um, some of the practicalities of, of, of this. Um, I was saying in a conversation I actually had um, as we're preparing this with Father Stephen and the other members of the panel that the Orthodox Church has um, a ritual for emergency baptism, <laughs> yes, which lasts um, five minutes. Uh, uh, we also have, and it stands today, and we have the ritual as we have it uh, in, in normally in the church now when we baptize a child or an adult. Um, but to think that this emergency service of baptism has is the distillation or is as valid as the baptism that people would undertake at the beginning of the church, you know, after years and months of preparation. Uh, so we, we can do that to that, this very um, fundamental service of, of being received in the community of the church um, without affecting the theology of it, as it were, the core theology. Uh, that is, that shows how the church with the guidance and as the work of the Holy Spirit can operate with a range, a range of um, practical expressions in, in terms of sac the sacraments. Um, uh, the fact that we have a, an emergency baptism service does not replace or annul the preparation that needs to take place under normal conditions. And it doesn't annul the fact that we have to, um, we have the service as we have um, regularly 
um, and so on. So it comes with within a context. We, we we need to be aware of that and also have the flexibility, I think, to to consider some of these things when reality challenges us. But that's not for me or for us to sort sort out at this time. I think. Um, but I think if we ask questions, is is we, we're placing ourselves in the um, in the best place possible. Um, if we're still working with with um, certainties, uh, when we're being asked questions by our, our, the reality around us, then I think um, we're, we're in a we're in we're stuck. Great, um, excellent. Uh, I'm, I hope I have not missed. Um, a question, let me just read the, the chat for a moment. Um, there was a question here asking whether the panel can offer a suggestion uh, or um, a reason why it appears that the uh, rate of deaths in Eastern Europe is far less than in the West. Is it likely to be a much better organized system or a theological influence? <laughs> Here's a, a question to... Uh, wake everybody up. <laughs> so uh, does anybody want to uh, take this up? Well, do, do we know whether it's a, a, a reality or an accident of statistics? I mean, yes. is it to do with reporting? I, 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 I wasn't aware of this, but um, there's, there's always the question of how these things are reported how much testing there is. Uh, I think it's it's also extremely difficult to compare, you know, the different countries. Yes. Because there are so many different factors that that influence mortality. So, you if you compare, for instance, Italy with Germany, or Germany with with Britain, even within Western Europe, there are enormous enormous differences, and some of these. Um, Factors are known, and others are not known, and also the, uh, the pandemic started um, in different countries at different times. Uh, in America, is also uh, behind Europe, so um, but I can't comment on individual countries in Eastern Europe. Yeah. Yes, I think that's as uh, reasoned an answer as we can um, get. Uh, we don't have enough information, and there is many variables. Um, uh, too many to uh, to uh, provide a, um, a running answer. Um, excellent. Um, I'm just again reading the chat uh, to make sure I have not missed anything. Um, I'm fully opening now the conversation for another five to maximum ten minutes to anyone wanting to um, ask a question from those still present. Some people have left, um, uh, sort of rightly so, because we've kind of overrun our uh, publicized time. But um, if anybody wants to ask a question or have a comment uh, or share something um, that um, they find it is relevant to our conversation and has not been um, addressed uh, already, you're welcome to do that. Right. Well, then, in that case, um, um, not to um, have an awkward silence uh, or too much of a uh, suspense, um, uh, I want to say thank you to the panel. Uh, I want to say thank, thank you to all who have participated. It's wonderful to see so uh, many uh, friendly faces and people that we know. It's wonderful to um, have people from all over the world, literally, and from next door. We have Father Paolo, Father Patrick from Ireland. We have Simon from Oxford, I suppose. Uh, James, uh, Kelsey, uh, Mariana, Jackie. I'm just um, reading out the names of those who I can actually see faces of. Uh, Liz um, um, and Mariana and uh, Miriam and Christine there. Uh, and Nicholas, of course, and Paul. Um, and, some alumni as well. Um, and some alumni of ours on the... Um, on the list, um, Father Aurel from um, um, Father Aurel, a, a colleague and friend of mine from Ox from London, priest, a Romanian priest. Um, I can see um, um, Egor, um, a former student of ours on the MA, 
uh, and so on. So uh, it's wonderful. This um, really has been a coming together of minds and of hearts. And um, I hope that taking part in this event has um, helped um, with some of the questions that you had, but also um, has provided uh, uh, some sort of space to consider and say things and ask questions in relation to all of this that we're going through. Uh, we will continue this type of events. Uh, we will have more people invited. This um, has always been, as it were, a pilot of an event. Um, I think we have enough data to um, be uh, bold enough to, to have a repeat events like this. So um, um, keep an eye on that email. We will uh, post another um, message like that uh, uh, before long. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. God bless you all. Thank you to the panel again. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Amen.